So, Jenny, you want to kick us off here? And let's get this conversation going. Let's get started talking about warm-ups. Before, but before we do, we should introduce ourselves for anyone that wants to share. You know, that way we can see who we're talking to. My name is Jenny McClay, and I'm the ICA social media coordinator. So I post most of the things that you see on Instagram, on Facebook. Jessica has been doing a lot of the YouTube, and I'm going to start doing some of the YouTube now, too. And I'm, Je- I'm Jessica Harry. As Jenny said, I'm the executive director of operations for the ICA. And uh, this is a, sort of a brainchild that she and I had um, after our panel during ICA Plays On this summer, where we talked about warm ups at length because it's something that we both really uh, find to be very important in our daily practice. So we're glad you're here. Um, let's go around to our um, other forum joiners here. Uh, let's start with Faith. Faith, can you tell us where you're joining us from and a little bit about yourself? Hi, um, I'm from Lakeland, Florida. Um, I'm a performance and education major at uh, Florida Southern College in Lakeland. So. Nice, awesome. And if anyone else, oh, you're muted, Jessica. If anyone else wants to introduce yourselves or share anything about yourself, just feel free. Like we said, this is a forum discussion. We don't want it to be me and Jessica talking the entire time. So we want to learn just as much as we want to share what we've learned. I'm hey, hello. hello from, yep, yeah, you first. I'm Dennis, oh, yeah. Dennis Cantoni from a town called Northeast Pennsylvania in the northwestern corner of Pennsylvania, right on Lake Erie. And uh, I'm an amateur. I started playing at age 10 uh, and for a period of time off when marriage and children took time up, I began uh, getting more serious about it about 20 years ago. So I've been uh, enjoying uh, resurrecting my uh, musicianship. Okay. All the best to that. Um, I'm Reinhard Wieser from Vienna. I'm a member of the Vienna Symphony Orchestra for many years also teaching at the Music and Arts University of Vienna. And I have watched ICA for many years now, and it's, I'm very excited to join a meeting now. And it's, it's very interesting to watch the videos also. Also ch- challenging my Portuguese and Russian it was very interesting <laughs> to watch. And I, it's, uh, I want to make big compl- compliments for you both because you're doing a great job. Uh, be keeping us all posted all over the world. And it's a pleasure to watch ICA grow and grow. Hi, I'm Alessandra. You hear me okay? Yep. Great, yes. thanks. Um, um, I come to you from Tiburon, California. And um, yeah, like, like Dennis, I started playing, um, I think it was age 11. And it was the clarinet that paid for my education. Like that little licorice stick was worth a lot of money and, and really opened some doors. I was first generation to go to college and the clarinet made it possible. Um, you know, and you know, I, a trauma took place and I never played again after age 23 until last year. So, Oh my God, three decades went by. Okay. So they say you can ride a bike again. Well, they're big fat liars. <laughs> So I'm learning everything over again and I realized that I need to have support and resources. So it started with um, the Claire Neat podcast, Sean Perrin. Um, We actually had a wonderful conversation uh, that directed me to some other resources like the ICA. And this is the first, um, first thing that I'm doing with ICA, but um, yeah, I did Woodwind Fest and saw some of you there, Jenny, I saw you there. Um, and yeah, it would be really good to have this support. So thanks. How about you, Colleen? Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Colleen for, and I'm in De- uh, Littleton, Colorado, which is a suburb of Denver. And, um, I started clarinet seven years ago at age 68. <laughs> what was I thinking? And then I had a wonderful teacher, but during the pandemic, she stopped. And so now I study with Josh Gu on um, the Zoom. So things are going well. (laughs) So you'll be sure to join us uh, in 2023 at Clarinet Fest, which is held in Denver. It will be the 50th anniversary. Oh, well, great. Great, great. 
yeah, it's going to be a wonderful event. Well, I just stumbled. Anniversary. I just stumbled on you. I just picked up my phone and and it was there, like in <laughs> Facebook or something. I I didn't even know about you or that this was going to happen. So I have no makeup on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's okay. So we're going to start talking about warm ups now that we've introduced everybody. And um, I don't know, Jenny, what do you want to start with? What what is what is the purpose of a warm up? Why do we do warm ups? And if you're new to the clarinet, um, why should you start doing a warm up if you've not done so? I feel like for me, the reason that I do a warm up is to literally warm up into what I'm doing. I hate using the words for the definition, but I feel like it better prepares me mentally and physically to dive into repertoire or other serious pieces that I'm playing. So my warm up routine, I joked before, but for me, my warm up routine starts out of the practice room. I always have to have some kind of caffeine first. So this is actually just water. I've already had a few cups of coffee this morning, but um, so I'm mentally aware, but then I like to do some stretches before I even take the clarinet out of the case. I've had some repetitive strain injuries before in the past. So I do simple stretches before I begin. I am by no means a doctor, so I would consult someone that is licensed in musical um, um, like injuries and preventions and things like that, but just stretch to get the body limber because it's actually a physical activity what we're doing in the practice room. And then um, I feel like I'm just better prepared to take on whatever I'm tackling in the practice room. And that's why I warm up. So if anyone else wants to jump in and share why warm ups are important, I like to be in a good headspace before I start playing. And I feel like right now, especially with everything happening in the world and, and so much mental strife going on, it's really difficult for me to focus on the things that are, are, are necessary during a warm up, which, you know, for me is tone quality. First of all, tone quality and, and, and the mental awareness of, of what I'm trying to achieve during that warm up session. So if we're doing long tones, you know, if you're not focused on what you're doing, you're not actually paying attention to the things that you need to improve, especially if you're a learning player. Um, so I feel like the, the, the best thing for me is getting in the right mental space before I start. So not necessarily meditation, but thinking about my goals for the session. You know, what am I, what am I really trying to accomplish today? What do I want to focus on? And practice journals really help with that too. If you're, uh, if you're a note taker, if you're a person who likes to schedule things, setting aside um, uh, some kind of written documentation, there are some really good apps for that, but um, of what you want to achieve during that practice session. So long tones, I usually almost always start with long tones and scales. Um, and I, I really, really love doing um, finger exercises. <laughs> I, I posted a video on YouTube, or not on YouTube, on Facebook recently this week about the Close 68 um, exercises of mechanism, which are my, my big favorite. I really love um, those exercises. I like transposing them and playing them in different keys and really working your fingers all the way through the range because a lot of times we'll take what's written for us and just let it be that. But I feel like engaging your mind as well is really, really important to getting the most out of these kinds of exercises. So that's, that's warm ups in a nutshell for me. Can I ask a question on long tones? Um, I would say that um, when I was young and studying, I avoided those because they were just so boring. Uh, and, I, and I realized when I got serious about it that that was going to be this key to successful sound, developing a good sound. Um, but in addition to the muscular development, what other, what other things should we be listening for in long tones? And what should we be doing to uh, get the most benefit out of them? I'd say for me, I think the answer will change depending on who you ask. But for me, long tones are like a musical multivitamin. You can really fix everything with long tones as long as you know what you're looking for and listening for. So I know when I do my long tones to fight boredom, I make sure that I'm actively listening. I feel like that's when we get bored is when our mind starts to wander and we think about what am I eating? What do I have to do today? But um, I might focus on one or two things like keeping a steady airstream and then having a smooth attack on all of the notes and having key goals in mind. They don't even have to be tone related necessarily for long tones. That's a wonderful time to focus on posture or finger position or embouchure, just because you're playing something so slow, it would be next to impossible to correct these issues when you're playing a Mozart concerto or something much more technically demanding. So 
for me, long tones are the time to revisit any of the fundamental elements that I'm trying to improve, but I'd love to hear what other people have to say. Brian, how do no, you now it's working. Yeah, sorry, the wrong <laughs> button. Uh, Dennis, I can help you with that maybe a little. Um, maybe you focus on uh, like like uh, Jessica said, you focus on one on one point, one one target. Be it, uh, for example, you can play the you can play the long tone softer, you can play them louder, you can make a crescendo, decrescendo, you can train sforzato, you can train forte piano, whatever you need in music. And when you focus on various areas, uh, then maybe this is easier and not boring at all. Yeah. I just, for me, I want to show you, I, I looked at these videos online, and there's one one uh, word which I missed in all the uh, warm-up sessions, that's um, that's articulation. You can train articulation with a, with a warm-up very finely. And of course, I uh, agree with Jessica and Jenny with all the, what you said to warm up your mind, your body, whatever. And I want to show you this book. Does anybody see this? Of Rainer Wehle, who is, who is a professor in, in uh, Lübeck, and actually the husband of Sabine Meyer. And uh, after years of playing myself and, and after years of teaching, I found this book. And it's really very good in, in training various aspects of articulation and also of tone quality and of timbre and it's it proved really important to, to my students and also to myself even after after many years of playing i found always things with this book uh, uh, to make the, to do things better so so when you focus the, it's 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 a book when you just first look at it uh, you ch you you think um, he must be kidding? It's always the same, which which is printed. It really looks boring until you actually do it. <laughs> then it's not boring at all, and it's really uh, uh, that's what I also do in warm up. I train my articulation. I train long notes, short notes, and everything. So when you look at these, one of these one of the books I want to recommend also. So, so right focus now, on you, one area. Hmm? Can you spell his last name? I, I will put it in the chat. Okay. Then it's easier, I think. Yeah. It's called Clarinet Fundamentals. And there's also a book uh, about uh, technique, which is also very good, but also a book about intonation. That's maybe also something you can do in a warm up session. Um, to train, especially with students or with a friend, uh, when you have a practice buddy, or uh, uh, even with uh, two or three people, you can uh, train intonation also for warm up of a, of a maybe of a ensemble uh, uh, session or quartet. When you play long tones together, when you do this intonation uh, uh, training by Rainer Wehle, because everybody, when I was studying, everybody uh, told me, uh, you have just you have to play in tune, but nobody taught me how to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's and I hear this very often from teachers in hearings, and so they say, oh, you just have to be uh, you have to play in tune, but who trains it with the students, uh, or, or it can be trained better at least. Uh, like in many, when you play with a flute player, it's different, like with an oboe or with a bassoon, and you can train it also in a clarinet or so. Um, so to that point, um, many people have asked us, how, how do you make long tones more interesting, right? Dennis sort of hinted at that, and I had a question sent to me. How do you make them more interesting, right? Because it is just kind of just playing long notes, literally. So um, one of the things that really helped me um, early on when I... I, I just enjoy it now because I feel it, like Jenny said, it's similar to stretching for your mouth, basically. You can really feel the muscles sort of relaxing a little bit and and getting getting ready for whatever it is that you're going to do after that. But I really like drones. Drones are incredibly great for keeping a little bit of variety to a warm-up in the long tone area because you can work on intonation, as Weinhard said. It's really, it's really great. So um, basically you have a tonal pitch. If you're going to play a scale, you can start just, you know, concert B flat, have the drone play the concert B flat, and then you start by matching that pitch. And then gradually you're going to work on interval building across that um, bass line, right? So have the drone and then play your C, then D, then E, and then match those intervals. And you can work on interval tuning as well. 
because as you know, the scale is not necessarily in tune with itself as a cross because of the overtone series. So um, I think we can share some information about um, drones, but does anybody else have any um, experience practicing long tones over a drone? I practice it sometimes uh, with the piano because I don't like the, the sound of the drone tone. <laughs> and it's always one, one note. Of course, you can change it. But I recommend it to my students uh, with a piano. You just uh, you, you put your foot on the pedal and then you practice intervals. And then you find out that your fifth is actually, your correct fifth is actually higher than that one on the piano you play afterwards. So that's kind of an interesting le uh, lesson to learn for, yeah. for everybody. Um, I don't know what a drone is. <laughs> so a drone, it comes in for a lot of apps, um, even like some of the old um, tuners and things like that. It's just a device that sustains a note forever. So one example, I'm sorry to do this so early. I use um, the Tonal Energy tuner and metronome app, and I'll just play a drone really quickly. So. Okay. That's all it is. So it just really helps you get the pitch in your mind. And there are some that have different frequencies. You can do chords built upon those. So there's all kinds of different drones available. Um, and I'll type that app in. That's actually one of my favorite practicing apps. But if anyone has any other recommendations, um, I love to comment. Feel free to mention any books, any resources in the comments. And Jessica and I will make a list of all of these so we can share it on the website. Thank you. Yeah, basically, you're just holding you, the the drone is a steady pitch, and you're playing intervals above that pitch and working on interval training, basically, with your ear. But it's it's a way to both train intonation but work on long tones because you're holding the steady pitch, and you can do crescendos and decrescendos within that. You can work on um, articulations and things like that because, as we know, any time you do a decrescendo or a crescendo or an articulation of any kind, the pitch of the clarinet has a tendency to change, be it sharp or flat, depending on the strength of your embouchure. So you need to build those skills and your ear gets used to hearing that drone underneath you and you learn how to adjust your intonation while you're um, playing long tones. And um, if you play soft, a lot of times our tendency is to be very sharp because we're biting in order to achieve that lower or softer mm -hmm. dynamic. So it's really important um, for long tones to focus on the embouchure and understanding the air pressure is what creates the volume, not necessarily the intensity of how much you're pushing with your embouchure here, right? I've used the, uh, the tuning CD mm -hmm. for drones, which varies because it has a lot of harmonics built into it. So. That worked well. And whenever possible, you can also do this with a friend. Start on one tone. Also, with a, it doesn't have to be a clarinet. Also, a, a bassoon or a saxophone or a clarinet. Start on one tone, and then one goes up. And in 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 intervals, as Jessica suggested, this can be really very very uh, instructive for, for for students and for everybody. Oh, I see a nice segue into maybe scales. We had a question. Before we talk about scales, the ICA is running a close A scale club. So, Jessica, you want to talk about that? We got a message. Um, where do we send the recording of the close A scale club? Maybe we can introduce that for anyone that hasn't seen. Yeah, sure. We're going to anybody that submits a recording, and we may extend this to maybe the second week of November. It's currently set to the third of November, but we are going to give everyone that participates a nice little official sticker that says, uh, you know, exclusive um, ICA Close A Scale Club member. And basically, you just record the Close A Scales worksheet, which is available in the public domain version of the Close A method. And we've also shared the link on our website, so if that's pretty easy to access. And it is major than uh, melodic minor, all the way through the 12 keys. Um, with their, And you can play it at any tempo. You don't have to play it fast. Um, I have a, a middle schooler that's working on it very, very diligently. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty difficult for her. Um, but... Um, close A scales is a very easy thing to put warm ups in your warm up, and we just wanted to um, encourage people to utilize um, public domain resources since there are tons of them available. And many of you know that the close A method is pretty expansive in what it's able to cover. Um, and I mentioned the the 
exercises of mechanism, which are one of my favorites. Um, and Jenny's shared that link there as well um, with the, the Close Scale Worksheet PDF. So if you'd like to participate, basically, you just record yourself. Um, either if you don't want to do video, you can do audio as well. You don't have to, you know, put yourself out there in the video format if you don't want. And then you can either tag us on social media or you can send it to us in an email. And we're going to compile a list and we'll put that in the uh, Clarinet Journal in March. Um, listing everybody that participated as part of this uh, event. So, and you'll is get a sticker the, too. Is that the Close a Scales single page? Yes. Yeah, the famous and one. It's but... like the scales, and then after that, it goes into the, the, the thirds and then also yeah. the, the arpeggio. So, it's just the scales. You don't have to do right. the other two. Okay. Unless you want to, because those are wonderful exercises, but that's not part of the Close a Scale Club. So, you can be an overachiever <laughs> if you want, but those are all wonderful scale exercises. If there is. Um... Also, other scales, if, if it's a topic, I also could recommend the, the uh, Jamie Ebersold jazz books. There's also these basic patterns, probably you, uh, you know them. And it's, it differs a little from other scale books as, as it concentrates on one octave, which derives from concentrating on the saxophone or on the trumpet. But it's actually nice because most of the scale books uh, work through all three and a half octaves. Uh, as you mentioned in one chat before, uh, uh, the, the Yetl, the Yetl school, but it, it has a big, big range. And, uh, but sometimes it's good in warm up, in warming up, concentrating on a special, on a spe one uh, register of the clarinet. And this uh, basic patterns uh, uh, sh sheet, for me, it's like uh, equally important, um, uh, like the, uh, as this, the closet sheet. Uh, but it concentrates on one octave and it concentrates on, on uh, scales and chords and it's really uh, it's really a nice uh, 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 sheet to practice <clears throat> I will I will also uh, I don't know if it's uh, I, I shouldn't post it uh, uh, but because I have a copy but then we have a problem with copyright uh, I, but I, I think everybody knows that Jamie Ebersold I will write the name in the chat then so it's also sometimes it's good to concentrate only on one octave if, if you have a really pe uh, a difficult passage to practice afterwards. So I recommend that also sometimes. Yeah. And if you actually don't know your scales and you're just starting out on the clarinet and you're looking for a way to visualize them a little bit differently, um, clarinetist Jack Leong recently posted um, all the major and minor scales with a fingering chart instead of reading the notes. And I feel like this is a really interesting way to approach this. I'm going to share that in the chat here. Um, I think it's really helpful. And I actually had a student that has difficulty reading notes. And um, we were working on training her ears. But at the same time, she's overwhelmed when looking at some in some scale sheets do not put the scales in quarter notes or things like that. So if she's looking at the close sheet and she's in sixth grade or whatever, it's it's a little bit too hard to look at a 16th note scale. Right, so you have to take that into account, but this was a really interesting way to visualize that. And you can focus on teaching them right up front what the correct way to play the concert um, C scale. You know, if you want them to play right and left on the B to C sharp, or if you want them to play left to right. So they can learn both of those things by looking at the fingerings as well. So I've shared that in the chat um, for anybody who might find that as useful. And something else about scales, I know, especially with a lot of people that are learning the scales for the first time that might want to participate in this, to go back to long tones, that's also a wonderful chance to practice things slowly. There's no rule that says we have to play scales fast. And I see that all of the time where people have this ingrained in their heads that scales have to be da -da 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 -da, super fast. But it's really about learning the key signatures and learning the musical alphabet, which is what scales are. So I love to practice scales during long tones because I can actually focus on the sound, the connection, and some of these that get lost as soon as the tempo starts getting faster. So if anyone has any other scale books or scale recommendations, now I guess the scale section of the discussion. Definitely go after the Yettle if you're looking for a challenge for range. If you really want to get into the Altissimo and be comfortable playing um, the scales up further because they don't just stop <laughs> so they keep going if you want them to go further um, Behrman's a good start um, because they go lower and higher but the Yettle can go all the way up to high C so 
um, I would encourage you to check that out. Um, it's a really good test of your um, diligence too, if you if you really like those kinds of exercises. Do you practice uh, Krebsch, the Krebsch book in America? Yeah. All four volumes. One of my absolute favorites. I actually just got done um, revisiting all four of those. They're wonderful. Um, I would say that's one of my top three favorite books. Here's an interesting question for everyone. I ask this a lot to my music friends, especially clarinetists. What would be your five desert island warm-up books? So if you were stranded on a desert island, you could only take five, we'll say method, etude, like warm-up kind of books. What would they be? The Krebs would definitely be on my list. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and of course, Yetl as a Viennese, I have to yeah. say that. <laughs> I would definitely take uh, the Tone Technique in Staccato by Galper. I love this book. It's 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 got so much variety into it, and and any time, you know, I have to think about that. What <laughs> Jenny? I think you asked that question before, but um, I would definitely take the Close A because there's a lot going on in there that you can adapt and change. But Yetl is is of the of the Behrman or Yettle situation, I prefer the Yettle because of the challenge that is presented by the range, for sure. Um, I guess that's only three. Uh, I have this um, random pirated copy also <laughs> of this uh, Leon Rushinoff clarinet method that I have had for years that I I really like, um, and I always like to see warm up books that were written by great pedagogues that um, actually talk uh, and actually have writing in them, not just necessarily um, the exercises, because I'd like to know how to play them based on what they feel is the right way to play them. So um, something like this also might be what I would take. I don't know if it's a warm up book, but the Yule. Yeah. Is it Albert or Albert Yule? It's, it's actually, it's actually, it's, it's actually. Yeah. yeah, I like that because it's. Um, for some reason, it, it's unexpected intervals and unexpected mm -hmm. fingering changes that trick your mind to have to concentrate on it rather than just playing through it. Yeah, when you master all etudes in the tempo he has written, which is probably sometimes too fast, then you are you are a, 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 a professional more or less. Yeah. So so this is one of our favorite books in Austria and and I, I think also in Germany. Yeah? For me, they are the, the most, uh, the, the best compositions among etudes. Mm -hmm. It's an island book. It's not scales, but it's an, an island book for me. <laughs> of course, they don't have to be scale books necessarily, etudes or studies or even, um, I don't know if this would be considered, but the um, Bela Kovac homage series. They are very popular here now. They are like little concert pieces, especially the Defaya is extremely popular. Also, it's in a competition piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people on Facebook are, are suggesting Krupsch, but um, uh, there was recently, I think, uh, Kristen Ch uh, Denny, she published... Um, I have the book. Yeah, I'm Krebs looking on my stand for all my books. Before you Krupsch. So it's basically like a simplified version of the Krupsch etudes. Um, I've been using them with my younger students, and they are sort of like building blocks to getting up to being able to play the, the full thing. And her books are really, really great. Um, she also I has a finger fitness book that's really good that just came out. So I highly recommend those. Yes. Generally. I didn't understand the name. Could you could you repeat the name? Uh, is, is it Kristen Chambers? Yes. Kristen Chambers, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yeah. I'll type down some of the names. Yeah. And someone I, else uh, mentioned Vadi Makem by Jean-Jean. Vadi Makem, Jean-Jean. It's also very... There's one more book, uh, Joost Michels. Is that, does that ring a bell? Because it, it's different from all other scale books in the, in the, in the point that it doesn't concentrate on the, on the C or G major scale, but it concentrates uh, first on the fingers and especially on one finger. i just show this very shortly. These are the basic uh, etudes or practices or whatever you call it. And it analyzes the movement of every finger. So first of your index, of your left index finger, and there is a different book for German and for, for Böhm clarinet because the easiest, um, the easiest scale on the Böhm clarinet, as far as I know, is the, is the C major scale. But on the German clarinet, it's the G major scale. So that, that you don't have a key, it's only holes. And, and this book, every, always when a student has a problem with a certain passage, I, I tell him they, have to, they all have to buy it. And 
because it's uh, when you analyze the movement of every finger, you come to s small mistakes or zones of improvement, as you uh, mustn't say mistakes these days. <coughs> and and you can with this book, you can analyze every finger movement, and there are certain uh, uh, etudes for every finger. So this is. Uh, uh, this differs from all other scale books, and it's by the uh, German Joost Michaels. He was an arranger, clarinetist, and, and a great pedagogue in, in Germany. I think he recently died. And his books helped my students and also myself a lot. Yeah? And you, you, you won't play it from, from one to page 95 or so, but you choose a certain finger, you, you left or third, uh, 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 second or third finger from the left hand, and you try to uh, um, uh, make the movement of these fingers better. So that's also maybe a, a real nice warm up book. Yeah? And you concentrate on certain, maybe very small areas of, the, of, the, of, the, of your movements and makes it probably better. Yeah? I will also write the name in the chat. Another one that I like, I don't know if it's been mentioned before, but my favorite articulation book is the classic Kell 17 Staccato Studies. I feel like it's just such a great collection of studies and etudes and different exercises to really develop articulation in general, but particularly the staccato. I found for me that the shorter the note length, the more difficult it is to make it symmetrical and have the same quality. So I don't know if anyone ever truly outgrows any of the books that we're mentioning. You just sort of cycle through them at different stages in your career. Yes, that's also a book to choose from, from time to time, but it's very good at it. Classic book for me also, yeah. So let's actually transition to talk about articulation and what you can do to practice articulation in your warm up and what you should be focusing on. Um, similar to the long tones, what are you listening for? Um, and how do you how do you practice various um, types of articulation within your practice session, be it through scales? Um, you know, I know a lot of people are familiar with slur two tongue two as a, as a variation that you can do. Um, when I was in middle school. Um, I learned my scales all slurred and then all tongued, and then the next thing I learned was slur two tongue two. But these are simple variations on articulation. But doing the articulation is one thing. But how does how is it supposed to sound, and what are you listening for when you're practicing these in your own time and your own um, privacy of your home or your studio? Yeah, <clears throat> I would say the most important thing is to to start with the beginning, the beginning of the of the note. And to be aware that the tongue does not make the, the tone. The airstream makes your tone. It's in many books written, but uh, many people don't remember it enough. And when, uh, when people talk about articulation, they're just talking about fast staccato, but not that uh, good articulation comes from, from a good sound in the first thing. And that's what, what I try to practice when I, uh, when I start to first really soft start a note to, to start a note really soft in all registers this is difficult enough and and to starting maybe with g1 and in, in all dynamics and then going up and down maybe first only in a, in a small in a small um, a section of the of the instrument and that's by the way also a really good warm-up to, to to make a really soft start for the for the note so and then also try to vary this Maybe with fortepiano, with an accent, with a sforzato. I, I rarely he hear people play a real accent because an accent basically means to get softer after the first approach of the sound. So, and, and people rarely do that. Everybody starts loud, but then they don't get softer. <laughs> At least some. <laughs> of course, they're fantastic players. Yeah? But, but to, to get softer and without getting higher. That's also the, also to listen to intonation. Maybe here also recording is a uh, it was never easier than now, but that you record yourself uh, in training articulation is also a, a really good point. Yeah. I have can, a, uh, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Jim. I have a CD. I don't recall who put this together, but it has um, Daniel Bernard uh, excerpts and different, and there is some staccato that he's playing that is. Just absolutely beautiful. It just comes out of nowhere. Um, and, and I don't know if it's appropriate here, but I've been struggling uh, because my tonguing approach has been uh, far down on my tongue. And 
uh, what I've been trying to do is to move my the tip back up to the tip of the reed. The difficulty I've been having is to make sure that that my tongue is high. So I find that if I, my tongue is close to the reed, um, I don't think I'm getting the sound that I like to get. And I have difficulty trying to get my the back of my tongue high uh, at the same time that I'm trying to t- contact the tip of the reed with the tip of my tongue. Uh, I agree with a uh, high tongue, but I don't agree with uh, necessarily with tip of the tongue to tip of the reed, because sometimes it's, it's better this here way. it's better to put the tongue a little far more down than here because when you play here then you have probably a very fast staccato but it's not necessarily soft this will be very a hard sound and then you go far a little more down with the tongue that it can be softer at least that's my experience but i, do, I don't agree to the tip of the tongue to tip of the reed it sounds nice but so it's not always it's not always uh, appropriate, especially if you need a soft if you need a soft um, attack. Hmm. But that's one of the most difficult things actually. To, when you think of eight hundred six, this this passage. Sorry for playing. Together with the, with the bassoon, so this is a really nasty passage to to get it real soft and not too loud and everything. So and this in this passage, for example, when you play tip to tip. And it's for me. It's more difficult than when you put the tongue a little uh, more down on the on the on the reed. Thank you. What does everyone else think about articulation? I was just going to ask. I know that this is one of the fundamentals of clarinet playing that seems to have so many different ideas. And I think I want to emphasize my beliefs for the clarinet is that there's not necessarily one right answer for warm ups for articulation because I'm sure if anyone has spent any time on clarinet forums we'll see some people saying that the tongue should be high, we should use the tip, we should do this, and there's no one right answer, just like every person is different. I feel like all of us have to find our own way and our own um, fundamental philosophies for playing the clarinet. So I'm always curious to hear what other people think. And it's interesting for me to have these kind of forum discussions just to see how people conceive these ideas. So if anyone else wants to share their articulation thoughts or any warm up thoughts, please do. I think that's a, a really good point. And just as, you know, she mentioned there are many schools of playing the clarinet and many great historical players have their own methodology and have written extensively about that. And so it's important to be open-minded. Um, I myself have had maybe seven teachers uh, uh, over the course of my training and every teacher had a different view on what tongue position is, voicing, and things like that. And so you develop your own vision of what that means to you based on all of those different perspectives mashed into one perspective, right? And so keep keep yourself open-minded to that. I will bump just a, a quick recommendation. Um, I believe that the Amakitia duo with um, uh, Diane Barger and Denise Ganey are president and president-elect, and they did a uh, an event a couple weeks ago, and they talked extensively about voicing um, tongue position and vowel. Um, so I will search out on that video and post it here in the chat. But it was a really um, enlightening discussion about where your tongue is when you're playing in different registers. And I think that's something that we can practice in our warm ups as well. What kind of um, what kind of vowel sounds are we using E versus, you know, ta, t, to, those different uh, vowel sounds, if, if we even use those in what register and how do they affect intonation. And so to Reinhardt's point about tongue position and in your mouth, a high tongue is great, but for many people, you know, our anatomy is very different. Our teeth are different. Our, you know, throat structure, facial structures are all different. So it may not be natural for you to push the very tip of your tongue to the tip of the mouthpiece at all. It may feel very weird um, to you. So a more natural position. And I, I like to play top of the tip of the tongue to the top of the tip of the reed. So more in this range to right about here. Yeah. Um, for 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 just natural playing, that's just for standard yeah. articulation. You come up a little bit um, for a very light, fast staccato, and down a little bit more, just like he has suggested. For a softer staccato, yeah, yeah, for a softer, softer and lighter articulation. Yeah. So, and vary that, of course. Yeah. Right. What also helped me was the was the word anchoring. What I read in many English books, David Pino and Howard Klug, and so, and uh, anchoring the time on your upper teeth. 
to to for, to make the tongue form a slide for the notes. This this picture helped me, for example, a lot to 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 get fast air and to get cold air. So this helps. helps Are you me. anchoring, Reinhard, at the back the back teeth? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm speaking E, and yeah. thinking whistling, something like that. Right. Because when you lower the tongue, then your whistle stops simply. And this the same happens with your tone quality. But yeah, the yeah. back the back of the tongue, as you mentioned it, Jessica, was always a, a sort of a mysterium for me. <laughs> I just just can't can't control it. <laughs> Basically, yeah. I can control uh, from speaking. Of course, you can control the the front of your tongue. But when it comes to the back of your tongue, to the throat, you have to. It's more like thinking in pictures, and it's getting really difficult there. And of course, that's very personal, as it, personal uh, as you say. Yeah. And, and actually, it's yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that um, your native language also affects how you interpret the placement of your tongue in your mouth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you speak a language that's very to the front of your mouth, then the position of your tongue is pretty much always close to the front. But if you're speaking a very guttural and throat style language, your natural position of your tongue is going to be further back. So those are all things that can affect the way that we produce a sound um, once the yeah. mouthpiece comes inside of our mouth. Anything else on articulation or any other questions in general that anyone has or wants to share? No. I was in a rehearsal last night on Zoom. I play with um, the College of Marin, the Symphonic Wind. So we're trying to wrangle the Zoom rehearsals for a wind ensemble. And it was very heavy uh, brass and percussion and flute. So the conductor had us do um, like triple tonguing exercises. So knowing I was a bit of the mat, the odd man out, I still thought through, okay, well, how, what, what, what sounds are they using? Um, Cause I don't, I don't know if clarinet, clarinet is triple tongue these days. I don't know. I'm completely out of style, but you know, using the, you know, deciding on whether to use the two or the T or the da or the duh, and then when when they got to the ka for the triple for the triple tonguing, I just experimented with it, and what I noticed was the tongue was in lower and lower positions on the reed. Like, so the the t's tended to be what I observed. The t's tended to land higher. The d sound tended to go a little lower, and then when you know, I just went with them on the triple, t the K seemed to go even lower. And it just made me aware of the volume of space that there really is. That just coming back to it and trying to just do what I could remember doing, like that was a very flat, undynamic space. And just working with the brass and the flutes last night, brought more awareness to oh be mindful of the space not just how the tongue feels but the whole space inside the mouth and onto the mouthpiece i know that some people use the k uh, sound for double and triple tonguing more like tuku 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 is very popular and that's what i was taught um when i learned but the 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 actual articulation on a double tongue is actually happening in your throat versus on the, the reed. You're not stopping the sound from there. You're stopping it from your throat because you're coming back with the K sound. So tu touches the reed, ku comes back. Tu, ku, tu, ku. Um, Spencer Pruitt is, actually recorded. The tongue is slower than to Alessandra. The tongue has to be lower when you, when you say ka. Mm -hmm. And that's also the problem for the sound because ta makes a normal clarinet sound, but ka is a is a brass sound, yeah. and your tongue is too low. Therefore, the sound is dull and worse for us. That's why it's more difficult on the clarinet. Right. Oh, I didn't say it was pretty. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. But it was it was you but know it was interesting. That, that that's you, you are completely true. That's completely true. Of course, yeah. well, the the zoom environment creates some unique opportunities because if everyone is on mute except for one person then you can experiment with 
people that you play with and you can just be God awful <laughs> and experiment and learn or observe something that you absolutely would not have otherwise. So it's, it's nice that there's like little upsides to this weirdness that we all live in right now. I think one of those, something that you touched on, Alessandra, is um, learning from other instrumental pedagogies. I know I do that, and that's really been helping a lot because we can only, I think, get so far in clarinet terms, but I turn to singers a lot, even for articulation, for tongue position. Where is the tongue if I were to sing this note very poorly, I might add, since I'm a terrible singer, <laughs> but um, I'll do that. Even recently, I've started playing the theremin, and that's been very humbling, but I've learned a lot just about clarinet's um, pedagogy from learning this new instrument, from having to learn vibrato and things like this. I think it's just a nice interdisciplinary way to think of some of our fundamentals in a different way. So there's, I have a question about that because you said vibrato. Like, so might there be a role that vibrato could play in warm-ups? I would say so. I know this is a very touchy subject. I personally have nothing against vibrato for the clarinet as long as it's used, um, I guess, in the right context. I think one of the best analogies I've heard to describe vibrato was it's a little bit like wasabi, that it's good in the right context, but too much, and the wrong circumstance goes, you know, very poorly. So I personally have nothing against it, but I've played a lot of pieces that I think call for it. And so I add maybe a vibrato exercise to practice doing the waves like this. So I might start with the waves further apart and then closer together just to control the embouchure and the diaphragm motion that I'm trying to build. But I'd be interested in hearing other people's um, maybe more organized approach to vibrato because that's something I do, honestly, only if I have a piece to incorporate that way. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a spice, right? You get too much and it might be considered oh. too much. <laughs> a little bit tacky, but I think um, you can practice anything in your warm up that you feel you have if you have a piece that needs something like that you know if you need to work on uh, glissandos for some reason if you're working on playing a piece that has a lot of that in it then there's no reason you can't incorporate that into what you're doing in your warm up a uh, warm up is simply a place to center yourself mentally for what it is that you want to achieve in your practice session and i think you know anything is is game in that at that point so if you want to practice that yes i think do it i think warm-ups have to be fluid too i know i wrote a blog post about this a while back comparing um warm-up routines to breakfast we don't always have the luxury of time to have like a full you know english breakfast with sausage and toast and you know jams and all these amazing things sometimes we do and that's so luxurious when i have times for long tones and scales and technique and etudes and articulation that's wonderful but most of the time my warm-up is five minutes of long tones and 10 minutes of scales or something that's very quick just like a lot of times for breakfast you might grab um I don't know, a Pop-Tart or something on the way out the door. You might get something very quick and easy, and then you just have to go. You're all about utility that day. But when you have time, I think we have to keep in mind that warm-ups can be adjusted. It doesn't always have to be the same structure from day to day. That's a good point. Actually, let's talk about that. How how What is the proportion of time in a practice session? Say you only have an hour to sit down and practice. What proportion of that time do you think is appropriate to spend warming up? And it again depends on the target you have. When you have a really diff uh, difficult solo concerto the next day, then you will probably only play some, some long notes and some articulation, some staccato to keep it shape, and then practice these nasty names, uh, français pas passages or, or whatever. But when you have the luxury of time and practicing, uh, then even only warming up can take an hour, then you drink a coffee. Mm -hmm. And then you go right in into your etude book or whatever. So I would say 
even if there is only one one hour, at least ten or fifteen minutes for warm up uh, is 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 very good. And but the important thing is, as you said before, to vary the the topic. You can uh, um, warm up with long notes, articulation, vibrato. I agree, Alessandra, as you said, that's an interesting point. And also, I might add, uh, vibrato is a way to learn and to teach Kisando uh, because it, mm -hmm. it it goes into one another. So that's also if you want, if there is if you play Rhapsody in Blue next time, practice vibrato. Why not? Yeah. And so so it it varies. Can so, I ask a question on Glissando since? Uh, you mentioned it twice here. Um, my understand when I learned, uh, glissando was basic was not the rhapsody in blue glissando at the beginning, but just a regular chromatic chromatic movement from one note to another. Is a true glissando more like the rhapsody in blue glissando, which is just a smooth <coughs> transition without any obvious steps in the notes? It just, when, when I heard it first, it was a glissando, but uh, I let the Americans speak first because this is American music. <laughs> <laughs> For us, it was, as students, it was always, it was always hard. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, Go ahead. Yeah, it, it was a kind of a kind of a, um, a, a sports competition to, to get out the best glissando uh, above from C2, of course. Yeah, before it's chromatic for Dennis because it's. It's very difficult and f almost not possible. But uh, above C two, you can you can slide around with your fingers, and the difficult point is not to be flat up there on the on the C. So go ahead, Jenny. Sorry. <laughs> I just feel like glissando. It depends on the musical situation. I played some pieces where glissando is meant to be a clean chromatic scale, and then some where it's meant to be sort of the the slide is what I imagine the rhapsody in blue glissando to be. So I think if the composer is still around, then you should ask them or listen to recordings just to see it. Really, there's so many um, inconsistencies in music, and I feel like that's one of them. Well, I yeah. guess the question came up uh, because I just a few years ago, playing a uh, wind uh, band piece that was a marked chromatic glissando, and I had never seen that. I've always seen glissando, which I've always played just on a chromatic scale, basically. And this was the first time it was called out chromatic, so it kind of made me question whether uh, there was another one that I wasn't aware of that's standard. But Because but, I always thought the Rhapsody in Blue one was kind of a unique thing. It was not generally applied. Yeah, I think it's contextual based on the, okay. the, the genre and, and the, the, comp the composer's intention. And range has a lot to do with that, as Reinhardt said. It's very difficult to smear if you're going to smear from pitch to pitch in the low register. Once you get right. above C, it's much easier to slide and, and use your lip a little bit to loosen the embouchure and actually get the pitch to sort of uh, be flexible enough to be able to smear like that in, in yeah. the Rhapsody and Glue. So that's why you hear people playing that actually almost stay in a scalar motion all the way up until you get to that C and then you hear the smear. Um, I think right. that's true for uh, the Artie Shaw concerto always comes to mind because he uses a G to G gliss at the end or is it a, and then there's a high G to high C gliss also at the very end and those are both really difficult to do um, but it it's really just contextual. I think in jazz you're going to see the slide motion more than you're going to see a chromatic um, scalar style yeah. gliss. I see we have a question in the chat. Does anyone have any techniques for relaxing your throat? Um, I tighten up for Altissimo and I'm trying to stop it. So if anyone wants to talk about that. I kind of do. Okay, so it kind of goes back to articulation also that um, I've always had like issues with articulation my whole time like on clarinet. So just recently I like was discovering like relaxing more and you know letting my whole body relax instead of just thinking about what my tongue is doing and whenever i like let my fingers relax my throat opened up and my tongue like relaxed also and so with like techniques for like relaxing your throat like maybe you just need to like relax everything and like do long tones and stuff and just focus on what your body is doing as a whole and like just think about your fingers and stuff and maybe that'll like open up for you also like it did for me um 
And then with Altissimo, like when I tongue my Altissimo, it I always want to pinch and like tighten everything. Um, but I, I find that if I like slur like scales, if I start on a low note and like slur up to the high notes or whatever, um, I feel what it's supposed to be like. And then I try articulating it slower and try to keep the same feeling in my like mouth, throat, all that stuff. So. That's really good. I would also add to that for relaxing your body. Something that I've been doing in the last few years is yoga. So this is maybe a more um, holistic approach to this, but it's just made me more aware of where there is tension in my body. So that carries into the practice room and I'm able to focus on like relaxing your shoulders or relaxing this body part because I feel like it can be overwhelming to just think relax. And how do you do that? I think that's probably the most counterintuitive advice that we can give is telling somebody to relax, but learning how to relax on the other hand, I feel is more beneficial. And a lot of times you don't realize it, but the tension in your throat stems from your hands. Realistically, the, the right hand holding the instrument, if you're holding it incorrectly, the position on your thumb, all of that tension can transfer all the way up here. So really having a good handle on what the correct position of your thumb is can in, impact the way that you're sounding all the time. So, and that, that is good for when you're standing or when you're sitting, if you're just thinking about that. And that's a great time to do that when you're warming up, focus on, okay, where is my thumb? For me, I like it to be in the very corner of the cuticle and the nail and pointed slightly upward and then, you know, making sure that I'm not putting undue tension in my wrists. So a lot of times for me, I have to shake out my hands and bring them back in a natural position to have them sit there. So that's something that like stretching is always good, but you know, being mindful of what your body is doing. And if there's a particularly difficult passage that goes into the LTSMO that has, you know, strenuous articulations and whatnot, you're going to be tense playing it. So the best solution to do that is to play it slowly. Practice it as slow as you possibly can so you eliminate that variable of being stressed over what that difficulty actually is, right? That's, that slow practice has always been medicinal for me. So, And you can take any passage in any piece of music that you have to play and use it as a warm-up. You can play those notes forwards and backwards. You can change your articulations. Um, vary it up. Um, I take two 16th note passages in various notes and play them forwards and backwards and then play in dotted eighth rhythm, you know, or 16th rhythms, triplets, whatever you feel like doing can really, and you're just practicing that passage over and over again and you don't even realize it because it's varied and you're, you know, spending more time. This is more actual like meaty practice stuff, but it can be done slowly and used in a warm up, and it will help you with eliminating stress and tension to deal with, you know, particularly difficult passages in a way that makes them, it's kind of like putting a, a hat on like a scary monster that makes them look silly. I think, you know, speaking in Halloween terms, I suppose that's this week, but, you know, demystify these spooky, scary passages in your music to make them a more approachable by making them into a long tone. You put a silly clown nose on them and now they're a long tone. <laughs> I had another um, question. One thing I did hear was, like getting your throat into a whistling posture. So like when you whistle high notes, you're more tight. And when you whistle low notes, your voice is more relaxed. Is that likely to give me any bad habits? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. No. But maybe the, the, the question concerning throat, uh, it's also like just, uh, Jenny mentioned before to ask a, a singing teacher. Because, because on, in, in, on one hand, it can, uh, relaxing the throat is also like breathing a little. And, and actually, I don't think too much about that, but a, a throat relaxation is probably more a singing matter. I'm sure a singing teacher can, could tell us more there. And whistling, I don't see why that, why in, in various positions, I don't see why that should make bad habits. I don't know. So. And then changing the subject, I also see Jessica left a comment about glissando. So going back to those, um, Kristen Denny Chambers, who wrote the books we had mentioned earlier, 
mentioned that a smear glissando, I often see a diagonal line between the notes. And for a more scaled glissando, I often see a weighty line between the notes. So good to know. What else? What other warm up topics haven't we discussed? Let's talk about phrasing and musicianship and how you can, I, mean, I know etudes are pretty much um, the go to for this, but what ways can you focus on those two elements in a warm up routine? Phrase, phrasing and musicianship. I'd like to start by saying um, to simply do them. That's something that seems sarcastic. I'm not, I'm being very genuine when I say that. It feels like so many people separate pure execution of notes for the warm up and then they could be musical. So I always encourage all of my students to play musically in scales, to play long tones musically, to practice like the Kell staccato studies musically. There's no reason that musicality should be omitted from a warm up routine. So play a scale like it's the greatest piece of music ever written to play with crescendo and decrescendo and rubato and every other phrasing that you want to do. Yeah, basically, to, it's it's a good training for phrasing to maybe to to phrase to different points. When you make a phrase like Mozart concerto, you train to phrase to the second or to the third note of the of the second bar. Or when you take a rose etude, you can uh, some passages you you can train to phrase to various places and also to make a diminuendo to various places. It's all up to your fantasy, like Jessica mentioned before. You can from every eight notes or four notes or five notes, you can make a, a, a train <coughs> for every passage uh, you feel. Maybe learning learning a passage from uh, memory, uh, uh, to memorize a passage, gives you even more fantasy. Uh, and, and also, if you play it for, for, uh, for a really important audition, also some orchestral passages, trying to play them in various ways because or that's also what, what conductors and our colleagues demand of you to play a passage not to the third but to the fourth bar or something and of course that also can be a part of warm-up it depends on the target of course does anyone else have anything to say about phrasing and interpretation I think you can also choose exercises that specifically focuses on or specifically focus on transitioning registers and things like that that are difficult for you as a musician um, because our instrument doesn't overblow the octave things can be quite difficult um, so one example um, this is in the galper book that i mentioned earlier tone technique and staccato um, this is a great exercise um, transition into the upper register and basically, um, it's focusing on utilizing the register key and overblowing the twelves to get the sound that you want, you know, without sl slamming the note, <laughs> basically. Focus on getting a nice tone um, as best as you can, and then you can add in, as you can probably see on mine, maybe if I get close enough, it'll focus. But I've added dynamics here, so I start with a v very full sound on the low C, and then when I get up to the higher G, it's a lot softer. And then I crescendo as I go down um, and create a phrase out of that. And then you take a break every time and then you can work on stringing several of these together. And that in itself is kind of like a long tone. <laughs> you know, you're playing a long phrase with no articulation. It's kind of a long tone. So you can focus on all of those things at the same time. But I think for, for me, Musicianship is, as Jenny said, something that you have to play all the time. And you have to tell your students this if you're a teacher and you work with them. Playing scales may not be the most exciting thing in the world, but you have to find ways to make them interesting and you have to find ways to challenge yourself to make them sound better every single time you play them, right? And that can be playing in different dynamics, adding different articulations. You know, for long tones, if you if you do long tones and you just play them in a scale, why not do, you know, different intervals? Do thirds, do fifths. I know um, Howard Klug has some really great long tone um, exercises in his um, study book that I use all through my master's degree, and I still go back to them every now and then. But they practice, practice going up in um, fifths and then come down in fifths or come down in fourths or whatever, just something interesting. You can, you can do anything that you want in this to make it less boring. 
But if you're if you're practicing the right things, it shouldn't be boring. It should be you're mentally exhausted by the time you've done practice, right? agree with all of that. I think something else um, maybe tangentially related, Jessica said something about making them less boring. Something I like to do is sort of gamify my long tones or scales or things like that, especially with younger students that might not be as excited about scales as I am. I love warm ups. I love scales. I love long tones. It's my favorite thing to practice. I would love to do nothing but all of these exercises we're discussing. But a lot of times for younger students, I will make a game out of it. We've probably all done some variation where you have to play something three times and maybe you have small objects like pennies or stickers or something like that. My brother has actually um, made a twist on that game. He got an action figure, I believe, for one of his students and he put it at one side of the music stand and for every correct repetition, it would progress to the other side of the music stand. So if you're working with anyone younger or even children at heart, if you're older, <laughs> that's perfectly fine to use just to make these more engaging. So it's not just the same routine every day. All right, I think it may have was Daniel Bernard who had the 10 times correct study you know so basically play through something um, be it a scale or a passage in your music and you have to play through it at a tempo 10 times correctly and if you make a mistake you go back to zero and then you have you know for me if i make a mistake i lower the tempo because obviously i'm not prepared to play at the tempo that i'm at and i need to be able to get it 10 times at this tempo before i move up the metronome and i do that for really modern music a lot of times has some really awkward you know as you mentioned the ul etudes some of that stuff just doesn't feel natural um even though it is really exciting and interesting to the ear but if it's not natural to you then you have to make it feel natural and the best method to do that is practice it 10 times in a row now do my students absolutely hate that oh yeah they hate it you know, you play a scale, you get to number nine, and you make a mistake, and I'm over here going, yes. Oh, you messed it up. Guess what? You get to go back to number one. And they're like, no. So You have to, you have to use that very cautiously because frustration <laughs> is not far away. Sure. But, if, you but laugh, I, if you're able to laugh about it and, and make the student feel like, okay, I got to get there. I got to get there. I'm really motivated to do it. So there, you're right. There's a very fine line. Yeah. Um, yeah. between like I used, it, I used it myself for really nasty passages that's my killer method to really master it yeah, yeah. but that's that's only the top of the of the of the of the methods yeah. that, but, but maybe the hardest one yeah <laughs> And that's actually a good point, too, because there are students who will take lightly to this kind of criticism and will not, you know, be offended by it. But you have to be mindful that every person approaches their playing in a different way. So if you're a teacher and you're teaching a student how to warm up and how to practice these things, you have to be mindful of their, their mental well-being and their ability to yeah. accept your criticism, right? Yeah. I interrupted you. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, phrase driving. I'm just reading my my things I wrote out, out from the Stein Keith Stein book, uh, and and the the uh, spe the sentence I really remembered was take time within time. Uh, so because you mentioned rushing rushing before many students and also you, yourself probably <clears throat> many times you play a passage too fast, and the metronome of course helps. But but when you when you organize the, the the passages into groups of four or three depending, uh, then this helps a lot and practice with the metronome and then put off the metronome and and try to play in tempo but really freely. That's the art. Uh, uh, what what you uh, what you uh, as a master what you have to be able to do. So and that's so difficult to get. And even with the metronome, because uh, when you think of Mozart concerto in auditions. You have to show that you uh, uh, are able to play free, free, but in tempo, because you are not free at all, basically in Mozart. But still, you have to show your phrasing, and that's what you can train. Also, in warming up, very fine with groups of four, and also with scales or whatever, to 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 phrase to a certain point, or also to get softer to a certain point. And one other point, uh, when you think of the of the Brahms sonata, uh, sometimes the the, the instrument. Uh, uh, tries to dictate the phrase for us, and that's also what you can train in in um, in warming up. That you uh, um, uh, that you uh, don't let your instrument play with you, 
that often happens with students that you master the instrument and, and you as a, as a professional uh, or as a player decide how the phrase is going to work. That's what you have to train because as you mentioned the registers before, the, the short register of course is uh, um, sounding very uh, softer to the, to the listener but louder to our ear because the, 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 the B major or G major is, is, is louder to our ear but not for the listener. So that's what we also have to train. And also we can do that, as you said, uh, with every phrase we can, especially with uh, register changes, of course. Yeah. Reinhardt, it's a very interesting comment you made about not having the instrument play you. Yeah. Uh, because certainly that, that uh, register change and uh, uh, can create a, a problem in a lot of uh, situations. One of the difficulties I'm having right now is you're also disciplined, is motivation. Um, I play in a concert band, I play in a clarinet quartet, and I play with a variety of, of um, trios and duets, uh, piano, violin, cello, uh, clarinet. And uh, none of that's been happening for the last six, seven, eight months at all. Um, so I'm finding that I'm, I'm not picking up the instrument as frequently as I used to because the motivation doesn't seem to be there to work hard at, at it at this point. Is that anything that you've been able to overcome or, or that you face at all? I faced it before. Uh, try to learn something new. Try to play klezmer or try to learn to improvise chess, for example. There is lots of books. I practiced all the corona time. I had the time to practice tons of, uh, of chess cells and scales uh, uh, from all books I, that are standing behind me. For 20 years, I uh, didn't have the time to practice them. So there's always something to do. <laughs> do you play chess music or klezmer or, uh, or? Yeah, well, yeah, I do. Uh, not klezmer, but uh, jazz. Uh, I double on saxophone as well. And uh, yeah. uh, I, but I've done both of those. Yeah. <clears throat> but the difficulty is just um, to. Uh, now, Alessandra mentioned playing in um, on Zoom, and I've been trying to figure out ways to get the clarinet quartet together to be able to do something. Um, but um, I'm of an age where the technology isn't as readily available to my mind. That's difficult. Uh, but uh, to think of karaoke. The, all your favorite 15 songs are on YouTube uh, 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 with karaoke and try to play the, them along. I do uh, that. Yeah. Sometimes at 10 in the evening. Yeah, yeah. there are several YouTube channels now. Um, one of my favorites is Color of the Piano, I think it's called. And um, the pianist just records um, different tempos of many major works for oh. clarinet. And um, he just plays them and you can just play along with it. It's really great to, to feel yeah, a connection cool. with that and to practice repertoire that maybe you haven't played before. Um, we'll put the link in the chat for that, but it's, that's been helpful. Really? And you know, motivation has been tough for me, for sure. Um, I'm a very social person. So being kind of holed up here and not being able to make music in person is, is a challenge. And um, I'm in a, a music recording collective for video game music and we make video game covers and <laughs> I've had to learn how to use recording software and video editing software and all these different things and it's a bit overwhelming at times. Um, but I just try to stay positive and think about what I want to do when I will be able to do it. And so that right now is planning Clarinet Fest 2021. We're working really hard. <laughs> To, to get that festival planned and, and praying that we'll be able to meet with you all in person in Fort Worth, Texas. It's going to be a massive festival because um, Reno was canceled and we're kind of smashing them together to make a huge event. Um, but so I'm, I'm trying to stay positive by doing that and, and working with my students on Zoom and trying to find ways and focus on ways that, and I practice what they practice. To be honest, it's not really that difficult stuff, but I, it's allowed me to kind of go back to some fundamental things that maybe I have overlooked and to just keep myself going um, when I find that it's just really difficult to do that. And Reinhardt is right. If you are having a hard time finding motivation right now, you're not alone, but you can also just practice something different. Um, maybe try transcribing a jazz solo. I don't know. That's not something that I do a whole lot of, but you know, it, it's different and it's a challenge and you can, you know, there's also groups on Facebook uh, for support. Um, there's a really great etude of the week um, group 
that posts right. stuff all the time where they're all practicing the same etude and talking about what they found challenging about it or what they enjoyed about it. And I think that kind of um, connection can be really, really important to helping you get through this difficult, um, difficult patch, which I feel like in the US is not necessarily ending. And I know parts of Europe is really flaring back up again. So um, I again, urge you all to be careful um, in your daily lives and, and protect your health as musicians because this disease does affect your your lungs um, pretty badly if you get a bad case of it. So please be careful um, and take, take your health and the, your family's health into consideration with anything that you do. Just, I don't feel like we need to say that too much, but we care about you and we want you to be protected. So, and we really want to get together and make music in person. So let's, let's beat it for sure. I have a resource to share. Um, so when, when we went, uh, California went on lockdown, I'm in the San Francisco area, we went on lockdown very early. So College of Marin buckled up and my clarinet was in the music building and I was not able to retrieve it for four months. So the habit of practice was just, it felt rather blown apart. And when I was able to get the instrument out, which was an ordeal, but when I, when I got it out, um, I was just, I was crushed because the second nature, the habit that I had finally achieved was just, it was gone. And I was so hard on myself. And one of the podcast that I listened to on Claire and Neat. I think it, I think it just dropped last week. Uh, Sean Perrin interviewed Susanna Klein. She's a, a violinist and she's a researcher um, in practice and practice psychology. And she has uh, come out with a journal. It's kind of a book, kind of a journal. And it really addresses like the heartache that musicians can experience in isolation. Now she wrote this, you know, before we all went on lockdown, but um, you know, you can order them in, in packs of five, but in, I just got it yesterday and it's called Practisma. I know, I know it's mirror reversed here, but it's not just like a blank journal. Has, have any of you seen it before? Yeah, so what I what I love is like in the very beginning, there's like the journal is guided by following principles. And it's basically about how to listen, how to put discipline in the context of of self-care and compassion, because there's the difference between how we want to sound and how we do sound if we really listen. And I think I bring a lot of baggage into the, my own um, the practice space because it's not just how I want to sound, but it's also how I remember that I did sound or I think I do. And so there's the, the, what she explains is the, the pain of self-criticism is the gap between how you sound and how you want to sound. If you can deal with that gap with yourself kindly, then you can move on to the actual practice and growth in in your instrument and so i hope that this is going to help restore that second nature to practice because when you're scared of it or you're scared you're going to be really self-critical it's it's hard to put the reed on the mouthpiece isn't it anyway so i, I thought that would be helpful i'll put it in the chat I've shared a couple links there. Um, Colleen recommended Band Lab. Um, she said that she uses that in her combo, and I've linked their Clarinet podcast, which is a great resource. Um, lots of information to be had there um, with Sean's podcast. And um, two Facebook groups, one for amateurs and one for just standard A2 of the week. If you wanted to be a part of either of those, I highly recommend them. It's a really great community. And I think the ICA will probably get something like that going um, for the winter uh, period um, to keep us all motivated. I know Jenny does some boot camps, which are always really exciting and really beneficial. She did, uh, what, Yedl, you did Ool. You did get a lot. I'll link yeah. some. If you go to um, my website and look at boot camps, I'll send a link here. Um, 
not to interrupt you, I was also going to put in a shameless self-promotion for the ICA. On the YouTube channel, we've been trying to do a lot more Zoom panels and interviews. So we have some interviews with people around the world and just different um, videos that we've shared on there. So if you want to check those out, I'll try and link that too. And yesterday we finally achieved uh, the number of people required following the channel to get our own um, handle. So it's it's youtube.com slash International Clarinet Association, which is a little bit easier to find instead of a bunch of jumbled numbers and letters. Oh, that's fun. Articulation Staccato Club? I'm going to have to have a conversation about that. I think that would be really good. Something like that. Yeah, why not? Articulation first. Yeah. <laughs> because it's more dead than staccato. <laughs> so I feel like this has been an incredible conversation. I hope that you've all learned something. I know I have. Um, and it's always sad to end a conversation after we've been getting such great information, but we do have to move on with our day and the Zoom panel uh, is over in a few seconds. So I want to thank you all for joining us um, and participating in this panel, but also in um, viewing the videos from warm up week. Um, I hope you'll consider participating in the close a club. Um, that would be really great. I'll be sharing the sticker design with you probably um, on Saturday. Once I do it, I have to do it. <laughs> so hopefully it'll look good. Um, I encourage you to check out um, the um, upcoming December issue of the journal. We've got some really incredible articles coming. Um, if you're not a member, we encourage you to join. We're running a $10 student membership uh, promotion right now, which is fantastic. We have lots of discounts. If you can't afford to be a member, reach out to Jenny or I. We'll get you set up with an Adopt-A-Member sponsor, and we'll get you um, in the organization. And we're also um, accepting membership to our committees. We're launching a whole slew of brand new committees, including health and wellness, pedagogy, um, internationalization committee, um, social media committee, pedagogy committee, like all these different committees. Um, and you can join those committees by reaching out to us. We'll get you set up with the link. Um, we're going to be meeting on Zoom um, each month to discuss ways that the ICA can further um, promote these different initiatives um, that each committee is going to be working on. And then we'll have some little get togethers at Clarinet Fest um, with these committees. So we hope you will consider joining those. As again, I'm Jessica Harry. Jenny? I'm Jenny McClay. <laughs> and Anytime you have any questions, please reach out to us. The ICA is so excited about where we're going as an organization, and we want you to come along with us. So please reach out, and thank you to everybody for watching, and we will see you again soon. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>